Thanks. Uh, so hopefully your day started a little better than mine. I first first thing uh, walking over here stepped into a deep puddle. So um, yeah. Anyway, so quick show of hands: Who already has profiling as part of their observability setup today? Okay, cool. So maybe 15, 20 hands. So um, hopefully for everyone else, um, I'm, I, I'll be able to convince you that this is a useful uh, tool. As we've already heard um, a couple of times today, um, profiling is actually also being um, specified as part of OTLP. Uh, so hopefully that'll also enable a lot of people um, you know, to both convince uh, your teams that this is a useful thing and that you know have choice between compatible backends. Um, so yeah, for um, those who maybe aren't super familiar with profiling yet, um, I want to do, do a very quick introduction of why this is useful in the first place and then we'll dive into how this works and how we can um, make best use um, of this data. So uh, to start, I want to start with a very, really quick um, short story of computing history and why um, now, in, in particular, it's a very important time uh, for profiling. So the year is 1971, um, and Intel um, pr uh, released this chip that was basically the first um, chip that you could buy um, for uh, commercially. Um, and so this was, a, this was a huge deal. And then in 1974, uh, Intel released this infamous 8080 chip. Um, and just from the original chip to this chip, the number of transistors in, um, in the CPU more than doubled. Um, and then quick fast forward to 1978, uh, we get another chip and we have 29,000 transistors. And you probably already know where I'm going with this. Um, this is something that uh, one of Intel's founders um, coined as Moore's Law, initially said every year the number of transistors is going to double, um, later retracted that statement and said every two to three years. Um, and originally this was a prediction that this is how transistors are uh, going to behave, um, and eventually it became actually a goal of um, uh, manufacturers of uh, CPUs. Um, and so originally, you know, it was like, this is how a technology is going to advance. And then eventually it became, we've been pretty good at this. So now this is our goal every time. So fast forward to today, um, when Apple actually last year, um, or maybe two years ago already, um, released this M2 chip. Um, one of the really interesting things that they mentioned in uh, the keynote when they did this, they said that the, the, the transistors in these CPUs are just over 12 silicon at atoms wide. So we're kind of um, wondering, you know, if we're wondering how, how small can transistors actually get, well, theoretically speaking, we think it's physically possible to build a transistor that is um, one silicon atom. And so we're about, um, you know, a couple of uh, halvings away as an industry from the physical limits that are known to mankind at the moment, right? So. With our current technology, we're not far away from um, the physical, physical limits. And so that leaves us with um, the situation where hardware is no longer getting exponentially faster, right? We're actually hitting the physical limits of what um, is possible. And so my prediction is, um, you know, even though this is, uh, this is kind of physically ending, um, actually Moore's law in a very different sense, is uh, going to continue to um, exist. However, not in the sense that um, you know, the number of transistors is going to continue to um, double every couple of years. It is uh, through two things. Either we're going to be seeing uh, specialized hardware, and we're already kind of seeing this in the AI world, right? Like there are chips that are specifically being uh, created for special purpose um, applications, and they vastly outperform uh, general purpose chips. And uh, the other thing, and I'm not a hardware person, so this is not a problem that I'm going to tackle. Um, however, we're, we can actually make much better use of the existing hardware that we have. And I believe this is going to stay true for years to come. And so how can we actually make use of our existing hardware better? Well, that is exactly what the crux of this talk is going to be about, is with profiling. So what exactly is profiling? Um, profiling is actually as old as software engineering as a discipline is. 
because we always needed to understand where our resources being spent. So if we wanted to make our programs faster, that's not just a today problem. That's something that we've always wanted to do. Um, and so profiling essentially is measuring uh, down to the source code line number where resources are being spent. And that can be, so far I've been focusing on CPU, but it can really be any resource. It can, can be memory, it can be network I.O., it can be disk I.O. Honestly, anything where you can have a stack trace, so functions calling each other, and a number associated with it. You can come, on, come up with your own kind of profiling. And we're seeing that a lot already in the community, actually. But most typically, and this is the thing that I'm going to be focusing on most um, in this talk, is uh, CPU profiling. And that's for, for ver a variety of reasons, but primarily because CPU tends to be one of the most expensive resources on our cloud bill. So there are roughly two categories um, of profiling, and I'm going to focus on not this one, but I still want to cover it real quick. Uh, so basically, there's tracing profiling and sampling profiling. And with tracing profiling, we want to actually capture every single thing that happens in our system. Um, and this can be super useful, but um, it has extremely high overhead. And so typically, this is not done in a produ production environment. Um, Instead, what most uh, production profilers do is um, they perform sampling. And this is actually the type of profiler um, that we're also specifying the OTLP format for. So um, that's why I'm going to be uh, also focusing on this. So essentially, what this means is in the, set, in the case of CPU profiling, every X amount of times per second, we're looking at what is the current function call stack. Right? And we're building statistics out of that to infer, OK, if we're seeing the same function call stack multiple times, statistically speaking, more uh, time is being spent um, in that function. I'm going to co uh, cover all of that in a little bit more detail again. But theoretically speaking, let's just say we're looking at the function call stack 10 times per second, and we're seeing the same um, function call stack three times. Well, then we're spending statistically 300 milliseconds in that uh, function. Obviously, the numbers are much larger, and so statistical significance actually um, is, uh, exists, even though we're not looking at the function call stacks only 10 times a second. So let's take a super quick and uh, simple example. And this actually, um, while I'm not diving into the OTLP protocol, this is roughly the structure of um, what, it, what the protocol is likely going to look like as well. So we have a timestamp. Um, and uh, the function call stack, and then um, either a value. And so this is also where we're, uh, one part where we're kind of discussing how to appropriately represent this in the protocol. Um, you either have just the observation of the stack trace, so exactly when it was um, collected. Um, if, uh, then obviously we don't necessarily need to have a value attached to it. However, there are also, um, cases where you may not want to save every single um, stack with its unique timestamp, that can produce a lot of data, right? And so um, it could also be we've seen this stack X amount of times over the period of 10 seconds, for example. Um, and so both of those things are going to be possible in, um, in the protocol. Um, but just giving a, a very quick example here, unfortunately, it looks a little bit faint, but uh, for those who maybe uh, can't, can't read this uh, further in the back, basically what we have here is just a main function that's calling function A, that's calling function B, that's calling function C, that's calling function D, and then function D just is something that uh, uses a ton of uh, CPU time. And so if we perform profiling, what we would end up seeing all the time is that we have this stack uh, that is just main, function A, function B, function C, function D, right? And so every time we look, do an observation at our program, this is exactly what we're going to be seeing. And so that's essentially the crux of how profiling works. We just look at what is the current function call stack, and we save that. And so um, in a more uh, real environment, it might look something like this, you know? Every X amount of times uh, per second, we look at what is currently the function call stack, and we just save that. Um, but how can we visualize this data in a useful way? We've already actually heard this uh, visualization a couple of times. 
Uh, today, um, for example, in the Jaeger update, we heard that um, they added the ability to also visualize tracing data using flame graphs. And so um, that is probably uh, the most widely known and used visualization. So um, if we're looking at this uh, stack collection here again, um, the way that we could, this is an, a way to implement uh, flame graphs. We essentially um, kind of uh, sort everything and then we can merge all of the functions that are the same. So in this case, you know, the same color means uh, same, same function. Uh, so going back and forth here a couple of times so you can see see the difference. So every time we see the same function on the same level, we merge it, right? And so now what we can infer from this is the wider the frame, the more CPU time in cumulative was spent in this function and its children. This is really important because now we can say, okay, this is actually the most expensive subsystem um, in my code. Right? And this is the part that I should be focusing on because if I can optimize this piece of code, it's actually going to translate into a improvement in, um, at runtime. And so here, one, one more time, basically the x-axis is the actual amount of CPU time. Again, this doesn't have to be CPU time. This can be the amount of memory in your process. This can be the amount of network I.O. Um, it can really be anything. And then the y-axis is just um, the call stack. It doesn't have any um, you know, numerical value. Um, it just so you can understand which functions are calling which other functions. And so um, just to clarify a little bit of uh, terminology, I have a super uh, simple example here. One more time, so we just have a main function that's calling function A and function, um, and function I calls function B. And so in this case, um, we, I ju I'm just gonna pretend that we did 10 stack collections, right? Eight times we saw main calling function A and then fun uh, function A calling function B. We saw that stack eight times, right? But then we also saw just the main function uh, three times. And so what that means is in cumulative, the main function used 10, 10 units, whatever that may be, right? If we're, again, if we're collecting at a frequency of 10 um, samples per second, that would mean the main function in total ran for one second and 800 milliseconds of that we spent in function B. Um, and essentially function A didn't actually contribute anything. Um, and so the terminology that we use here is cumulative and flat, or some other systems also call this self. Um, and so main actually only has a self value of two here, whereas function B has a self value of eight, right? Function A actually has not contributed at all. And so therefore function A has a self value of zero. However, it is calling function B. And so therefore in cumulative, it and its children are using eight units in this case. This is important because there are basically only two ways to optimize code. You don't do something or you do something in batches. And so um, what that would mean is if we saw this kind of situation in real life, the only way that we could really optimize anything in, um, in, the, in these stacks is not calling function A, or if this is an interaction that fundamentally needs to happen in our system, right? Our system is doing some work that is hopefully useful. Um, and so if this is something that we really have to do, then the only other thing that we could possibly do is either optimize what function B in particular is doing or not call function B in the first place as well. So yeah, hopefully that clarifies, you know, cumulative versus self um, and flat values. Um, we've actually been calling this um, visualization flame graphs, but actually the creator of that visualization originally called this flame graphs, where the bottom of the stack is truly at the bottom. And um, what we've been looking at so far, and basically every, every pub, uh, visualization that you see uh, being called flame graphs is actually what Brennan Gregg calls an icicle graph, so where the root is at the top and we're building it downwards. Um, typically, you'll see icicle graphs because they're just easier 
uh, for humans to parse and to visualize because if you need to know what the kind of height of your visualization is gonna be, that's just kind of a pain uh, to implement in a UI. Again, performance engineering is not actually um, all that hard. There's no, no magic to it. You need to, need to measure and then you need to optimize. And like I said, really the only two things that you can do to optimize is not do something or do something in batches because CPUs are better at that. Um, and so really all we need to do is we need to measure uh, to see where we need to look. I happen to work on an open source project called Parka. Um, and this, this project is also um, uh, OTEL native. We actually also have our own protocol and we're kind of trying to reconcile that with the, with the working group um, to figure out you know, what about our protocol is useful so that we can influence um, what, that, what that may look like in um, open, open telemetry. Vaguely speaking, this, this talk is not about Parka, but just for uh, kind of an understanding because I'm gonna do a demo in a second as well. Um, it consists of two components, the server component, so the thing that stores it um, and allows you to query and visualize this data. And then we have an eBPF-based agent uh, that is actually now also based on the um, OpenTelemetry eBPF agent. It used to be two completely separate uh, code bases, but um, essentially we were doing exactly the same things um, as two Apache 2 licensed uh, open source projects. And so we all kind of decided uh, to to join forces on most things. We actually do still have our separate agent that just, like I said, implements our wire protocol and stuff like that, but it's kind of getting thinner and thinner as a wrapper around the eBPF, uh, open telemetry, open uh, eBPF profiler. So architecturally speaking, the way you would typically deploy this is you have the server as kind of a central component, and then you deploy the agent on all of the hosts that you want to profile. And that's really it. Thanks to the kind of magic of eBPF, you don't need to instrument your code, no SDKs, no nothing. Everything kind of happens um, automatically um, and you know, takes like five minutes to set up. So here he'll, we'll start a super quick demo of Parka. So this is what it would look like if the demo gods allow. Yeah. So here um, at, the, at the top, what we see is just a metrics graph. Uh, we're essentially synthesizing uh, metrics from the profiling data. So what we're seeing is essentially, if we were to look at Prometheus, just the CPU um, total, total graph. But much more important, um, we can see the uh, icicle graph across the entire infrastructure here. And so the reason why this is an interesting thing to look at um, we're now looking at all the CPU resources spent across the entire infrastructure. This is a demo instance, so primarily it's Parka running in here. But um, the reason why this is useful is if we now optimize something in this icicle graph, it would actually translate into a real cost saving across the entire infrastructure. So if cost is something that you're um, wanting to optimize for, this would be a really interesting query uh, to look at, or you know, it's just the, the default query. Um, in Parka, you can kind of also filter uh, by labels in the same way as you're probably familiar with uh, Prometheus. Um, we also have some kind of cool um, visualizations, um, you know, not just the um, flame graph itself, uh, but also uh, various other ones. But I just wanted to give a super, super quick demo. I'm gonna dive into some concrete examples of where profiling uh, was used or could be used uh, to, to optimize. So that was the super quick demo um, of Parka. So now we're gonna look at a couple of examples where either we've already used um, profiling to optimize open source uh, code or you know, just theoretically examples of the way of queries that may be useful for you to run um, across your infrastructure to optimize uh, certain situations. So one really cool example um, is we actually run this uh, YouTube live stream, although we haven't been doing it in a, uh, for a while now, but we have about 30 episodes where we took um, random open source uh, software um, that ideally we run ourselves in our production infrastructure so that it's not synthetic, but actually real usage. Um, and one example that we looked at was uh, ContainerD. And um, here I'm gonna pull up some profiling data um, from uh, ContainerD. Let's make this a little bit bigger. And um, 
basically, like I said, the way we look at this data is we kind of recursively look at what are the largest frames, right? So um, basically what we want to start with is obviously runtime go exits. So that's basically the main function in, in the go, uh, go runtime. Um, <clears throat> That's not something we can optimize, right? Like that's just the main function. Um, it doesn't really do anything useful in our system. And so the first, the next biggest frame that we're going to look at is this one. Um, it's doing something, something stats collection in uh, container D, right? This is definitely useful. It needs to do this. Um, so there's no really no way around this. However, could we optimize uh, particular pieces um, of this? And basically here, whoa, zooming in makes it a bit flickery. Um, we quickly realized that this read you in function um, is something that is used all over this um, code base. Um, and something quickly uh, jumped uh, into our, our eye. Basically, this all uses this read file function um, in the Go runtime. And just to, for the, for the sake of uh, saving some time, I already have this open over here. Um, and the reason why read file may not always be the best thing to use, um, especially for this case that container D does all the time, which is it reads things in the proc file, which tend to be, you know, 20 characters or less files. Um, and so the read file function is actually not optimized for cases like this at all. It first figures out what is uh, the total size of this, func of this file. We already know this ahead of time in container D. So this is actually work that is completely unnecessary to do. Even more importantly, it then goes ahead and um, allocates, some uh, allocates some memory, and memory allocations are notoriously um, CPU, um, CPU heavy. And more, even worse, we don't actually know the size of this allocation ahead of time. And so therefore, the memory allocation actually has to happen on the heap and not on the stack. And so this is what makes the read file function um, very good and very general purpose, right? So definitely always start with this. However, if your profiling data says that these functions um, are taking a lot of time and you know exactly what you're going to be reading, you're almost certainly going to be able to write a way more optimized uh, version of this. Okay, I have three minutes, so I'm going to try to run through the other examples. Bottom line is, um, we, I'm going to uh, skip over how we optimized this, but bottom line is this basically improved container D for all install installations on the planet. This, this is a workload that runs probably millions of times, right? Um, this one very tiny code change improved it by almost 5%. Um, and so if we keep doing this, we can definitely squeeze out way more out of our existing hardware. I'm going to... Um, just very, very quickly go over this um, Rust example because I want to show that this doesn't only work uh, for Go. Um, another super cool uh, feature that all of this has is this uh, function caller and callee um, view. So I'm ju I just double clicked real quick on um, malloc. So, you know, the thing that in libc um, allocates memory. And so now we can view all the functions that are calling um, malloc across the entire infrastructure. So now we can figure out where are all the expensive allocations happening throughout the entire infrastructure and start to optimize those. Um, so just wanted to show this kind of th stuff works for Rust workloads as well. Um, now, something that we actually do at Polar Signals all the time, we happen to have actually built a, a custom column or database to back um, our product, and so we optimize specific interactions in our system all the time, in particular queries. We want queries to our system to be extremely fast, right? And so I'm just going to go into our system here real quick, and what we can do is we can just say, I want to filter all the data down to only the stacks that contain the query path, right? So now this entire journey of finding the right uh, profiling data completely, completely goes away. So all we need to do uh, whenever we want to optimize queries is, okay, say, okay, I want to see all the profiling data across the last week, filter it down to everything in the query path, and boom, I can immediately start optimizing my code uh, based on real usage data. All right, unfortunately for the last demo, I won't have um, enough time because I'm almost out of time. However, um, we also have a really cool um, 
integration for um, distributed tracing where we can attach the distributed tracing ID to the um, stack trace. And so therefore, we can basically pull up all the CPU time that is um, spent across an entire uh, request, right? Even if, as it hops through multiple network services. This is actually something that we're actively trying to contribute to the um, eBPF um, profiler because basically we needed to figure out a way how a process can communicate this to eBPF. Um, so yeah, um, this stuff yields huge um, improvements time and time again. And so now you have the tools that it needs, that you need for uh, Moore's Law to, to continue. So long live Moore's Law. Um, if you're interested in this type of thing, we have a booth um, at P10. Uh, so please come and visit us. Thank you. <laughs>